Hello, quick disclaimer, guys. On um, on this webinar we held with Matthew Tucker, it will be of importance to you if you have or do some background on Python language, or else it might you might find it to be too technical for you to understand. Silver's Traders Lounge welcomes you all to yet another webinar where we learn trade and profit. We shall be giving you trading insights on technical analysis, fundamental analysis risk management and trading psychology. Our guest today is Matthew Tucker and our theme is automation for trading. Matthew Tucker is a market strategist, stroke technical analyst with 20 plus years covering experience covering global macro instruments in Forex, fixed income, equities, commodities and emerging markets. Matthew started out as a manual prop trader but transitioned into automated trading designing quantitative trading systems for commodity and equity instruments at Kashna Trading Group and T3 Trading. Matthew currently covers global macro markets at Informa Global Markets, where he uses Python to create quantitative trading models and signals for clients worldwide. Welcome, Matthew. It's an honor to have you again on the Trading Lounge. Uh, thanks very much. Glad to be back here. Always enjoy coming on the, the uh, broadcast here. Yeah, and I know you're very passionate about quantitative finance. Maybe you can give us a brief history into your automated trading journey and why automation is, is good for the modern day trader. Sure, so as you mentioned, I started off doing uh, manual trading and really the interest first came up uh, as a result of trying to scale out what I was doing as, uh, as a trader. I was trading one stock, I was trading equities, and I realized that you could kind of quantify what I was doing. It was based on just reading the tape and looking at the flow of orders as they came in into the market depth. And then, you know, I would trade when there was an imbalance in orders. And so that's something that computers could handle. And so that really began my journey uh, in terms of using computers to, you know, leverage what we see in the markets um, and scaling that out, you know, into as wide a range as possible. All right, cool. And the last time we spoke with you, you gave us like a, an introduction into Python and application of that language into automated trading. So maybe you can tell us, you can take us through a detailed walkthrough of some Python based uh, Forex market event studies as we begin. Sure. Uh, let me see. I can share my screen now. Uh, hold on a sec. So I've got Spider open here, which is an IDE, which is you know where I have a script over here on the left. And uh, so first of all, um, you know, it's, it's worth noting that with automated trading, um, any, any sort of model that you're going to build uh, has to come from a strong foundation. And that's where the idea for an event study comes about. You know, there's, if you get online and you, and you research trading, trading systems, there tends to be this mentality that, you know, there's, there's a system with some secret sauce or something like that, where it's this unique combination of indicators or factors that's going to give you, you know, endless profits and work in any instrument. But um, that's not really the case. Those models tend to fail. They tend to be overfit. Really, you're much better off starting from a strong foundation. And that's where uh, I can walk you through kind of the process. Um, uh, and this is also um, an indicator or an event study that we use at Informer right now. Um, what's really interesting, and this is also a great example because this looks at uh, candlestick patterns. Um, and what we're going to be doing here is leveraging this the TA library, which is uh, it's it's a really big Python library that's used in you know most people that are doing any sort of research with Python and markets are going to be using this TA library. It's got you know the, this is the GitHub page, but it lists um, down here all the different studies that are in, are included, and these are like you know bread and butter uh, TA indicators. You know you know you can just see the list here; it just goes on and on. But uh, as part of this, one of the, the lesser known or utilized components of uh, the TA library is the candlestick. And you can see here, these are all the candles in pattern recognition. And so 
I'll show you here. So um, this is our script here. We're looking at 20 years of data. I'm looking at FX. I already ran this, so um, it takes a you know a few seconds to do that. But um, just to show you like a little bit the idea, and also stepping back um, with Python, uh, one of the, the biggest components of any sort of research with Python. Um, it's going to leverage pandas, which is, and pandas can be thought of, and it's a library that comes within uh, the spider IDE. You can download it separately um, if you need to. But uh, pandas is kind of like Excel in terms of uh, the structure. It's, you know, a two dimensional array. Um, and I can show you an example of what it looks like here in a second. Um, and so right here, all these different patterns that we're going to be looking up here. Um, it's just two lines that that generate that many rows within pandas. Um, hold on, sorry. Bring up. So when we're downloading data, we're getting all these. These are the G10 tickers, and so we open this up, and so this gives you an idea of what we'll be doing. So we've got our OHLC data, but then these are all the different, you can see up here at the top, all the different candle patterns. And there's quite a lot. And so what this is doing is, and this is over, this is 20 years of data in each FX pair. So it's, it's quite powerful. Um, and then what we're doing over here is we're looking at the performance on each day, uh, one day ahead, five days ahead, and 10 days ahead. So we can kind of see, and that's really, you can step back for a second here, any event study, what we're doing is we're isolating something that's happening in, in the markets, and we're just, we're going to see how the market performed after that. And we're looking one, five, and, and you know, one day, one week, and two weeks into the future. Um, and so, Coming down here, uh, this is just, you know, no need to get into the nitty gritty of how this works. Really, I'm just moving data around and just, you know, column headers and then generating the data, getting the data from each of these individual data frames and then putting them into um, two different data frames. And so the first one here is what I decided to do was to sum all the signals in each day. So you can see with um, with this TA library, the, the, the pattern analysis, if it's a bullish signal, it gives it a score of 100 and a bear signal is a score of negative 100. And so let me go back in here. Um, this part here, table one. Try this over here. So we have some signal. So you can see here, it's summing all of the columns in each row. So this one has two bullish signals. And then we can see in this instance, the following day, uh, this is Aussie, Aussie dollar, uh, Aussie dollar traded up uh, 0.8%, although it traded down a week later and two, and two weeks later. But what's interesting, and again, leveraging the power of data, and uh, again, stepping back, you know, the question is, you know, what, why do we do this? You know, you can see something on your screen, you can see a pattern, but with this, you know, within 20 seconds with this Python script, we can see how, you know, that what happened when this occurred over 20 years. And, you know, that's quite powerful. So um, this is the result of this study. So the sum, so this is currently what's happening in, in foreign exchange. We have, uh, Naki, uh, the, the region Krona. Uh, so it's it, it, the bullish signal is three right now, which has occurred 123 times over the past 20 years. But what's interesting is, you know, this is a mean reverting uh, instance in this case, and which is you tend to see quite frequently within the FX space. So that's not surprising. You know, conversely, on the downside, your dollar has uh, you know a bearish signal of negative two, and you can see that the this has happened 217 times, and there's a positive expectation over one, five, and 10 days looking out. 
Now, the second table that I generated using the candle patterns here um, is tracking each pattern individually. And so this is where you can, this is pretty cool. So you can go down, where is this? So now you can get the specific pattern names and what's occurring. And so with Ozzy here, we've got a bullish factory. To be honest, I'm not even sure what that is. There's so many patterns and you can look up, uh, there's descriptions when you come back here, if you go into the GitHub page, um, and you can also just obviously look these up. You know, these are all discussed, um, you know, and you just do a Google search. But um, again, you can see when these are occurring, what the performance is. So it's really all about, um, and you can still use your, your, your ideas as a trader and what you're seeing on your screen. But what we're doing is we're taking a more scientific approach and we're trying to arrive at, uh, you know, to see what really happened over time, you know, with as much data as possible. Um, now, another event study that I worked on with a colleague out of uh, our London office, Ed Blake, um, we wanted to look at, uh, so, well, first of all, one of the things that you'll see in any financial press or anything is how big the market moves. And that obviously is important to people because you know they're holding positions and if there's a big move, it can be you know quite painful or it can you know quite make people happy. But you know, using the same approach, we want to say, like, what happens after there's a big move in, in an instrument? So let me run this while I'm talking here because this will take a minute. So again, we're gonna look at FX here. Um, but uh, so my colleague Ed had the good idea of combining uh, that approach to see, you know, what the performance was after a big move or a move the same size as what's, you know, occurring uh, in these instruments. Um, but looking at that within the context of where the instrument is trading within its 52-week range, because there's, that's an important thing to, to understand. So, you know, if the stock is, or an FX pair is up a lot, is it has it traded down over the year and it's bouncing now or you know is it overbought is it near the upper end of its range and is it uh you know what's it doing within that context so it's, it's quite powerful um what i in this instance and in, you know you have to kind of think about how you you would describe a short-term trend it's not just one day what i chose to do uh was a, a five-day return um, which was then also normalized. Uh, I used the rolling Z-score, three-month Z-score, um, because some of these, like uh, Naki and Stocky, their percentage change on a daily basis is much larger than the US dollar, the DXY index. So we normalized that by using a Z-score. Um, and so you can see in my bottom right, my screen here, uh, this has all the information and so, these are also on the left, just going back here. Uh, this is where I classified the trend and I gave it a score ranging from uh, two to negative two, two being the most bullish, uh, negative two, the most bearish. And that's based on the Z score. Uh, so let me come back over here, uh, start over here. So in this far left column, the range percentile, this is showing, this, this is plotting where, so for instance, CAD USD, that's you know the loony, uh, where it's trading within its range versus the dollar over 52 weeks. So this is quite bullish. It's you know probably making new 52 week highs. And so in order to simplify this programmatically, we I broke this into deciles. So it's trading in the you know the the 10th decile. Everything dollar is really weak right now. We can get into that you know my macro take later, but obviously you can see. Everything is, you know, uh, Swissies, um, you know, is is in the eighth decile. Really, only the Japanese yen is trading in the lower third of its range, um, and DXY, obviously, you know, conversely, is in in the in the first decile. However, from in the, within that context, we can say, okay, how how what is the short term trend? And what is the performance? And we've got one day, five day, and 10 day. These are the average returns. And then the frequency column is showing us how often that's occurred. So obviously with more 
a higher frequency, that's more significant. If there was only one or two, then it's kind of, it's a little more random in terms of the results. Uh, and so let's look at this. So with the CAD, you know, it's, it's trading up strongly in the 10th decile. And over a week later, you can expect, you know, you're, you're returning 46 basis points. Um, and then it's a little bit, you know, it might peel off after that typically. Uh, let's see, and I've also bolded these that, to, you know, the bigger moves that stand out. So Aussie dollar here, um, it's pulling back right now. It's near its 52 week high, but um, you might have a little more reversion short term, but within a week to two weeks, you can expect uh, a rebound. So um, again, this is just leveraging Python, but again, and going back to trading systems, this is where you can start to build a foundation for a trading idea. And, you know, I mentioned things like reversion and continuation. And so when you see this, you can start to think, okay, uh, maybe I want to build a Bollinger Band reversal strategy um, in Aussie here or anything. This could be a filter within your system that, you know, decides to either do a trend following or a reversion system based on its historical performance. Uh, Another table that we looked at was highs and lows. That's something else you'll also see. I'll run this. Um, oops. Sorry, that one. <laughs> yeah, with programming, you never know. You have you know errors come up, and, uh, and I'm not going to bore you guys with trying to debug that right now. But again, um, what I can do is we created. Uh, this finished product here, which puts all these things together, including the new highs and lows. Let me run that because that's going to take a minute. Um, as a PDF that gets exported um, for clients. But uh, so with the new highs and lows, you'll often hear, you know, the dollar's making a three month high, three month low. You know, what's the performance when that's happened historically? So, um, and this is what's great about Python is, you know, going back to this candles, you know, we're looking at, I don't know how many this is, this is, you know, 50, 60 can, uh, candlestick patterns, but, you know, within, you know, 200 lines of code here, we're able to track how any instrument, I mean, I can put in any ticker up here, you know, I also have, you know, fixed income and equities versions here. Um, and we can track as much data as I can get my hands on, you know, with Bloomberg can get up to, you know, 30 plus years, depending on the asset class, how these instruments have performed over that time period. Um, so it's, to me, it's just, it's, it's pretty powerful and, you know, it's really fascinating to see how, uh, things actually perform. Um, you can see sometimes it's pretty cool, slow. Uh, this one is downloading, you know, we've got 12 tickers here, um, going back 30 years. Uh, one of the other cool things about Python, uh, so we can see here, this line, bring my mouse here, with our data frame, and then just putting brackets next to that. So this data frame is just, again, think of it as like an Excel spreadsheet for let's say dollar. So with dollar and then in brackets, it's showing me, all you're gonna say is in minus one is the last row of that data frame. Uh, show us every row where the row, the bull signal is the same as what is showing in this, in this instance, the dollar. And that's it, one line of code. And that all that does is filter and show us the data that we need to see. Um, and you can filter, filter data frames, which is what we did with this example up here with the deciles. And then, so first I, I have filter one here is where I'm getting, what's, tell me what the decile is in this instrument in the last row. And it's gonna, so we have every day where the decile is the same. So 
every row where if this is sterling, uh, where it's in the 10th decile. And then from within that, so we, we, we created a, a version of the data frame here, filter one, and then we wanna know where the short-term trend of the last row, last row being today, um, it's equal to the same short-term trend. So it's double filtered and then uh, we can all, you know, we're just adding the information that I'm just taking the mean of an axis zero is column. And then these are our uh, three rows, two rows and one rows from the right end of our data frame, which happens to be our forward looking uh, returns. Um, let's see, this is still downloading pretty slowly, but you know, circling back, this, the structure here, when you're, when you download to a data frame in Python, one of the most useful things that I learned is this forward looking returns. You know, I have three, three versions of it here. And so you can put any factor in, you can download any of these uh, TA, you know, indicators from the TA library. And uh, let's see here. Going back to my data frame here, here we are with Ozzy. So we could do anything. We could just say, write a little, uh, a loop where it says, okay, if, and I'm just gonna make this up here for simplicity's sake, but if close is greater than high, uh, actually I couldn't be, if, if close is greater than open, so it, it traded up for the bar, uh, uh, then you can, what you'll do is you'll capture the returns into a, you know, uh, a list or something. And it'll just, every time it'll loop through this and they'll go through every row and it'll say, okay, this is what happened the next day. This is what happened the next day. Uh, usually as you know, you're looking at daily returns as a trader, um, cause that's your holding period or this could be bars. This could be 15 minutes. Um, but it's just so powerful and it's so simple. Uh, you obviously also need to model in, you know, transaction costs and you might need a little more involved um, of a back test in order to do that. But if you wanted to see quickly if an idea is going to work, Pandas uh, is quite useful. So gosh, this is taking forever. <laughs> but we're, we're almost done here. Um, okay, here we go. And this is just going to give us um, all three of these. So here we go. And this should launch also, here it comes. So this is the PDF. Uh, this is the fixed income group. Uh, this is, this shows our returns in net change because fixed, uh, with, with uh, rates so low right now, yields like a yield, if it goes up even one basis point, it can be, it'll, it'll look, it'll express it as a 100% return. Um, and you know, so these are basis points here. And so this combines everything uh, that we just looked at so far in this discussion. So starting off here, we have our uh, 52 week range of short-term trend. And you can see, uh, I don't need to go into the details here, but again, you can see, uh, you know, a reverting process um, in some of these. We also have new daily highs and lows, which I, you know, wanted to show you in the other version, but here it is. So, you know, the three-day high, which has happened four to seven times, and it's not that significant, uh, you know, as you'd expect a three-day high is, it doesn't really stand out on the chart. And as you can see, the expectation over 30 years is basically um, the sideways move. And then we have the lows version. You know, you can see some of these stand out here, um, seven-day low. Um, as you can see, and these are, you know, G10 yields. Uh, and you can see just by looking at this that obviously yields are going down today. Um, and then we're only having, we have one uh, candlestick pattern. One of the things that uh, with this, you know, we don't want to see every single uh, move that, you know, where the expectations are small. So I made a filter that, you know, we have to have a three basis point move um, in order for this to show up. And so in Canadian 10 year yields, that's what's happening right now. Um, it's a bullish signal. And it's interesting to see that over weeks that the 94 instances when this has happened over 30 years, we have a three basis points uh, expectation. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, what is this? Um, so 
that really is it, you know, what I prepared for the event studies. Um, I also have some interesting points about working with automation for trade. I don't know if you want me to um, begin discussing that now or. Yeah, uh, I think you can, you can go ahead and then we will conclude with the other questions later. Okay, sure. So, um, you know, it's funny because <laughs> I'm gonna share some things here uh, in my journey with getting, uh, you know, some of my trades actually on Kraken Exchange, you know, trading crypto, um, which I've done some work with this year. And there's a lot of good advice that I'm going to share right now that I wish I had known uh, because, you know, these are things that you learn when you're trading live and you start to, you know, put money in the markets and you can see what, what comes up. And so, um, just starting out from the top, when you're running, and I'm going to bring up a script here. I've taken out the logic, but um, you can kind of see uh, what the process is. So uh, oops, let's get those down. Um, so first off, when you're running, when you're trading uh, with Python in the markets, you want to use as little data as possible because uh, you want your scripts to run as fast as possible. So for instance, let's say you have a moving average system, you know, with like a, a 200 bar moving average, you only want to, uh, you know, use maybe 205 bars of data because obviously that's going to speed up your time. Um, and one of the biggest uh, helpful points that I can give at this stage of the analysis is that you want to trade at the end of bars when you're doing this type of trading because one thing I noticed is that especially when you're trading a portfolio of securities, um, they all have to be aligned in terms of the the most recent trading data. And what you'll find, and I found this out the hard way, was that uh, if you run your script, let's say you're trading on 15 minute bars, if you run your script, you know, right at the 15 minute change or even three seconds after some of those instruments will not have traded by the time you're, date, you're, you're downloading the data. And so they can't be included in your analysis. And so the way that my script was written was I, um, I aligned everything to whatever. Uh, so if there was a script that didn't have data, everything else wasn't counted that did because I needed everything to be up to like whatever the, the, um, that, the, the, uh, the instrument that didn't have as many as much data, sorry, this is probably not as, probably kind of confusing the way I'm, I'm saying it, but I think that the larger point makes sense that you need to trade at the end of bars. So for instance, if I'm, if I'm trading on 15 minute bars, uh, I'm gonna run my scripts at like 14 minutes and 30 seconds into that uh, 15 minute increment. Um, now, so here's the logic. What I do, another thing that um, was a little confusing was how to automate the script. You, and with, with cryptocurrencies, they're running you know, 24 seven. So obviously you need to have these things constantly watching the markets. And there's a few options that you could pursue. And depending on your strategy, um, what I found quite useful was the schedule library. And so everything is encapsulated, all the logic uh, within a function. Um, which you can see right here, but then at the bottom, uh, you can see here, this is a, you know, an MA strategy. Um, and I have this, to run, it runs every four hours. And you can see right here, I'm running this at, uh, you know, 59 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, so I'm trading at the end. Now you can see here, it can get quite extensive in terms of uh, your, your trade execution. And what you have to do is you have to think about the order in which you want the trades to be executed and you always want to be closing positions that need to be closed first because you want to you don't want to run out of capital so if you have a trade you're swapping one trade for another you obviously want to close the positions that um, aren't going to be open the next bar so you get the capital back then you can use that to trade whatever you need um, and so you're going to can't well actually I can I take some notes here. So you actually need to cancel on the open order. So you might have some executions, depending on if you have some limit orders, you want to get those out because those can actually hold up capital depending on, you know, you're the exchange you're trading with. Um, and then you're going to close any open positions and then open any new positions. Uh, 
one thing that uh, is good to keep in mind when you're first starting out is you want to be able to uh, send test orders. So with Kraken, um, this line right here, validate equals false. This uh, turning this to true will actually send the order uh, to the API without actually really trading. It's a test order, and you can if there's any sort of uh, errors in your code, and there were with mine. There's certain things you know leverage needed to be updated and uh, certain things, um, it'll it'll give you an error. Um, another key component, uh, as you can see here, is error handling because there, even if your code is perfect, the exchanges that I've seen in my experience, they're all gonna at times they're they're gonna go down. They're gonna have an API error, and if this is you know if this is going on in crypto in the middle of the night, you don't necessarily want. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have error handling, it's going to shut your script down and you're not going to have anything uh, trading. And so by using error handling and also, uh, you know, printing to your console if that happens, which, which uh, you know, which ticker failed to actually use potentially why, uh, that's, that's really key. Because um, then by using error handling, uh, the script will continue, um, and but also it'll print out if something happens. So let's say you wake up and then you can see, okay, you can go and do your debugging and see what happened. Um, another thing that, you know, I'll say like programming in general, but also trading and expect is like a series of headaches and, uh, and happiness when you, you know, figure out what, how to fix something. And so there are so many, I mean, so going back to Kraken, certain things like Kraken, if you're trading Bitcoin, for whatever reason, internally, once you execute an order, the ticker changes. Uh, I can show you how I dealt with that. So up here, there were, uh, so, well, even the example up here is uh, ZEC. Um, with internally, there's an X place before the Z and a Z before the USD. And so you have to go in and figure out, okay, um, I have to change that. Uh, you know, within the code and figure out how it works. Uh, another thing with Kraken is that, let's say you have an order to buy one Bitcoin, but you know, you get six different people actually fill that limit order. It treats that as six different positions. And so when I first started trading with them, the way they had it written, I, you know, I, I got my open positions uh, and I was closing that based on open positions later if that was what the signal was, but I was actually executing it six times. And I was like, I woke up and I was like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm short. It wasn't Bitcoin. I wasn't trading, you know, one Bitcoin, but I was short and I, I didn't know why. And that's what it turned out. And so there's, you have to figure that out. And the great thing about Python is you can go on and you can say, for instance, so say I have a list and one ticker appears six times, you could just go into, uh, into Google and say, remove duplicates in list Python, bam. And you'll have, you know, there's, there'll be thousands of uh, so potential solutions, usually stack exchange is the best. But um, so the point is that you need to really, you wanna start, you wanna do minimum orders when you're first actually trading live because there will be issues um, There'll be little quirks with each API. Um, but the other thing too is uh, it's worth noting that, um, so I'm gonna show you here. The great thing about Python is there are tons of wrapper libraries that you can use um, to interface with an API that makes the functionality a lot easier and you can you work within your language. Um, so for instance, this is what I chose. I asked one at the GitHub and just typed in Kraken API Python and you can look at um, you can look at usually this number of stars that you know you see on GitHub is like how popular something is. And then it's good if they have some, you know, a readme with like good examples. And you can see this one was great because it just gives you straight ahead, like, you know, how to get data quickly. Um, and any of these wrappers, they're still gonna be using this, the, the, uh, 
obviously using the API. So you go into Kraken's website and you can see all the different methods that can be used within Kraken. So all of these, if you want to figure out, okay, um, how do I get my account information? That'll be under user data. Uh, you know, you can get your account balance. And so these things, any good wrapper is going to just directly point to this. So um, even if it's not listed in there, you know, the readme, you can say, all right, well, I need to get my open orders. So, okay, there's a get open orders. And then you can look that up within the functionality of your chosen uh, wrapper. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's a fun journey. Um, the thing about automated trading is that, you know, there's this, uh, when you first start out, you think, oh, it's going to be, um, you know, I'm just going to push a button and it's going to go. Um, and eventually you get to that point where it's in full autopilot and you haven't seen any errors pop up for a couple of weeks, but uh, <laughs> it's quite the process of getting it smoothed out. Um, you know, when you initially um, start building something like this. So that's that's pretty much what I prepared for the API stuff. All right, thank you, Itaka, for that presentation. Uh, Gilbert has a few questions for you. Okay. Hello, Taka. Hi, Gilbert. Uh, so that was quite a detailed uh, presentation. Uh, maybe for those of us who are not familiar with uh, Python and programming, um, is there like a, a practical um, like um, explanation that you can give us, like how when you implement this code now into trading, um, like um, you know what kind of results you've been getting? Um, maybe any other challenges that you receive from back testing and then when it comes to live trading or forward testing, uh, when you're actually implementing the strategy, how you overcome some of those challenges uh, when it gets to the market evolving beyond maybe what you have tested in the past. Sure, so um, that's always, that's, that's a really good question. And um, there's kind of a rule of thumb that when you look at uh, a strategy profile when you look at and you're going to be looking at the annualized volatility but probably the easiest thing to use is the maximum drawdown and so i forget what the exact factor is but general rule of thumb is you can expect whatever the maximum drawdown is and then some you know that's not the scientific term but you know maybe 1.5 but um there's a couple of things you can do depending on the, the system, one method that I've used in the past is actually, and this is something that was harder to do in some of these like retail oriented languages with like easy language or NinjaTrader, but with Python, it's easy to do is what you can, you can put an equity curve on, I'm sorry, you can put a moving average on your equity curve. So your equity curve is your cumulative profits over time, but you can use, let's say like a 50, bar 50 day moving average on your equity curve. And so that's a good systematic way to protect yourselves from extended from extended drawdown. So when the system starts to, and all these things are cyclical, right? It depends on the market regime, um, how mean reverting it is, uh, you know, how much it's trending. And so you have to be aware of that. And so you can just, you can just all be done program programmatically so you can, uh, if the equity curve of the system drops below the average, you just don't send any trades. Um, and conversely, if it's above it, then you're back in action. Um, but yes, you know, you generally speaking, you you one thing that's useful to do is obviously you're going to compare your results versus um, you know what the back test was. But another thing that's important to do is once you actually start trading, is to continue running the back test. Um, and compare, run, those, run the back test on the portion that you've also been trading and ensure that the, the returns are um, the same as what you're seeing in live markets, because that also will tell you like how accurate your, your trading costs, slippage and execution costs are. But that's the key component, especially when you get into lower, uh, higher frequency, you know, uh, you know, hourly bars, 15 minute bars, like the trading costs become so high that, um, that's a big issue. 
Yes, thank you for that. And in fact, um, when you were talking about the uh, when doing high frequency trading, um, with regards to like scalping systems, those systems that are in and out within, uh, say, about a minute or two or under five minutes, and um, the fact that slippage does play a huge role in the performance uh, in live trading. Uh, so would that also be advisable that you still conduct the back tests even as you're doing the, 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 the forward test or the live trading to figure out whether your system is being able to, um, you know, to be able to plug uh, or to be able to factor in the slippages that you're receiving in the real market? Yeah, I mean, if anything, it's actually more important within that shorter time frame because there are so many more moving parts. You know, you 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 have to you're probably leveraging market depth data, you know, level two data, and so that's quite complex um, and data intensive. And so you definitely have to have a much more keener sense of what the market was doing on in a higher precision level. So. Yeah, that would also help you, um, again, fine tune the accuracy of such, you know, uh, a back test. Also, when it comes to developing a system, because um, I'm seeing, you know, you've really taken us through a very complicated process. Um, well, for me, it seems complicated, but I'm sure there are some programmers out here who, you know, everything, uh, they've been able to understand everything. Um, so my question is like, how long does, does it take for you to, uh, from scratch, when you're building a system from idea phase to the point that you're now comfortable to implement it? Um, how long does that journey take for you? That's a good question. Um... I would say, and then going back to what I touched on briefly earlier in the presentation with the pandas, um, it can actually be pretty quick, depending on the idea. Um, you know, maybe a couple hours even just to see if something would work out quickly. Um, but it's hard to really put a number, uh, a, a figure on it in terms of the time because uh, there every little system is gonna be different in terms of the type of signal that comes out, um, uh, you know, how, how often it trades. And so you're gonna to have to, that's gonna become a factor in terms of how you're working the, the API um, to some extent, but um, it, it differs on the, strat the strategies too, but I, you know, all said, I would say, you know, in short, putting it all together, it could be as as quick as a few days, but it's more likely to take um, uh, you know a couple weeks. Um, but yeah, it's hard it's hard to really give a precise answer on that. It does vary so much, really. Okay, and um, I would also like to open the floor to uh, our audience. If you have any questions please feel free to type them in the Q&A section of the chat section and we'll post those questions to Mr. Matthew Tucker so that he can be able to respond. Uh, there's one question from Richard. Uh, he's saying that, you know, with this looks like it's your, well, not that it looks, it is actually your work. <laughs> uh, this is your original work. And he's asking um, if you have an automated system that is running, then at what time would he uh, get the chance or at what point would you get the chance to actually learn? Uh, so what would you advise for someone who is learning how to trade manually and also wants to get into automated trading? Well, with manually trading, uh, you know, there's the resources are infinite. I think the best thing you could do um, is to try to get on a desk because that's really where um, you can learn the most is with is is trading with other traders getting uh you know a feel for the life cycle of um seeing moves in the market um trying to capitalize on short-term volatility um, and such and uh i would say 
in terms of automating your trading, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can go. Um, obviously, you need to have a, a pretty solid foundation with Python, but once you once you get to that level, um, for instance, there are there are so many people online, programmers, and also with you know within the trading uh, space that are more than happy to help with your questions. So for some of these, uh, you know, I, I I I couldn't going back to this, um, you know, I'm not sharing my screen, but when I was there was the default for uh, the default setting for Kraken was to send a test order and I couldn't figure it out. I was like, you know, why I'm doing everything right um, and it's not being sent to the market. You know, I'm seeing it, it looks like it's executing, but I'm not seeing it, you know, corresponding in my account uh, in the website. And it turned, I just went on to the GitHub page. Um, that's what I was gonna say. So with the, the GitHub page, you can raise an issue. And there were several responses within a few hours, you know, from people all over the world. Um, and it turns out that, you know, that's the default setting. And you, I didn't even, you know, have that as one of my arguments within the function. And so I put it in, you know, I forget what the, the terminology is, but, you know, I turned that, you know, validate to false. Um, so the simple answer is just go online uh, with, with the manual trading. Um, you know, if you can get on a physical desk where you're in the room with people, that's highly advisable because it's just a different energy when you're on a physical trading desk. If you're sitting by yourself and trying to source things online, there's going to be a lot of noise. Uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, just who are just, it's more, it's more about, um, uh, maybe selling something or, you know, you have to be careful because it's just, there are, you know, there's, there's just a lot of different, um, you know, people that they're not there just for trading. They're there with the business of talking about trading. You get, you get what I mean? Um, and again, with the Python is just, it's the language right now that, you know, it's, it's so widely used. There's so much information. I know, oh, this is, I'm, I'm glad that, I'm sorry it took me so long to get this, but you go on YouTube, there's so many people will walk you through some of these, they'll, they'll, you know, some machine learning models and you can just start programming, write it out, you know, get, get it, go get, uh, you know, Spider, um, download some Python and then just start, start doing it. Go on, just search Python uh, trading, you know, walkthrough on YouTube. That's, that's going to be super helpful. Um, and then you'll you'll really start to get a feel for it. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you conduct your quantitative analysis for several candlestick patterns? Well, you know, going back to uh, the beginning part, uh, really, it's just a combination of leveraging pandas and a TA library, and so again, I like to think of uh, pandas as just like an Excel worksheet. Um, you know, a two-dimensional array, and uh, and it took a while to start thinking of it that way. But you know, with and it seems so common sense now. I think of it, but every row is a day. Once you get those forward returns, once I can see, okay, this is what's happening. These are the returns after, you know, every single day. Um, then you can just start throwing in stuff. Okay, and you can throw in columns. You can, you know, it can be an RSI. It can be any indicator you can think of. Um, and then you can start building, you know, if you know anything about programming, there's, um, you know, if then logic, any programs can be structured that, structured that way, you know, traditional logic, if, you know, RSI less than 30, so that, you know, that, that would mean it's oversold. Um, and then you just say that if RSI less than, or you could say, you know, uh, when I showed earlier how we're filtering, getting the rows that we want, we could just say, Show me every row where RSI is less than 30. And bam, you can see, all right, this is what is this is the performance. So you can see if there's any merit to it. But with candles, it's the same way. So again, I'm, I'm just leveraging the TA library, which has the pattern recognition built in. Uh, I will say I, I did remove some of them because their their definition of you know what, like for instance, a belt hold. Um, which had some variations of that where I didn't necessarily agree with, agree with them uh, based on my definition of the pattern. And so I've removed some of those, but you know, 
all said, like the fact that you can have you know 50, 60 patterns and see what the performance is, uh, it's it's quite uh, useful. Okay, and um, kindly explain to us uh, broadly about data driven data driven investments. Sure. So, I mean, it's really. Uh, what we've been talking about here, I'm going to run, uh, maybe share my screen one more time. Um, this is another cool indicator that I have been working on. Uh, so actually, um, for instance, you know, one of the things that, you know, in preparing for a talk like this, uh, one of the things people will often want to hear is, you know, your, your perspective on you know, global macro instruments, what do you think about the markets? Um, and there is, I was reading this book, it was talking about the direct, the market divergence index, but um, it's not, it's not a unique idea for, from the book. Um, it's also, Perry Kaufman had, uh, he called it the efficiency ratio. I've also heard it called the signal to noise ratio. Um, and this is, I'm kind of giving an example of a data-driven approach to investing. So, um, what this does is it uh, it measures the amount of noise in um, in an instrument. And so it looks at, um, so I built this function up here. It looks at, it's a simple calculation of the total move for a period. So I'm doing a hundred day period, the total net change divided by the sum of absolute net changes, which sound, may sound a little hard to, to grasp, but all it is is uh, let's say, you know, uh, the spider, you know, ETF went up 10 points over um, one week. If it went up every single day, then the, the value would be one. But if it went up, you know, $3 and then down $2 and then up three. And then, so basically if it goes down and up by taking the absolute uh, values and then summing them, uh, it shows you how how much, how much it reverted within that process. And so you can see on my screen here, um, what I've done is, so this is, you know, using the Bloomberg tickers, we've got 52 commodities broken into the asset classes here. And I've created an index by taking the average of each asset class. And the, in the, in the book I was reading, it talks about, uh, it says 0.1 is, is the cutoff for trending or, um, reverting asset. And so this is non-directional based. So if something could be going down um, and it would still be, you know, the signal would be high. So you can do two things with this. You can look, this is over um, going back to August of last year. Um, you can see how the, this evolves over time. You can see like in November, there was a lot of noise in all of these different asset classes and that bottomed out. So you can look at the absolute value, which is where the actual value is at any given time, but you can also look at the trend within each value. So you can see right now, um, all of these, all macro assets are kind of getting a little noisier. They're both, they're all coming down. Um, so knowing this, uh, you can, this is an example of using data where you could allocate funds to a certain asset class. If you see it maybe, um, you know, back here in November, if you see, okay, red is equity. So it's, it's been really noisy, but, you know, it's starting to trend higher, meaning we're seeing, um, we're seeing more signal, we're seeing more directional moves um, within that asset class. This, could, you know, I can also plot any of the individual, so equities, um, which one is equities? Equities would be four, I believe. So we can look at the individual. Yeah, oh, sorry, three. Forget that Python is indexed at zero. So there you go. And um, yeah, this is you know, global, equity index futures, and this gives you each individual market. So that's uh, just an example of, um, you're just leveraging computers and data. I mean, the, the human mind, the human eyes can only see one you know, screen at a time. 
and we're also subject to all sorts of biases and irrationalities that we all have. I mean, that's what behavioral finance has, you know, kind of unpacked over the last couple of decades that even if we think we're super rational, we all have, you know, things that cloud our judgment. And so the more that you can incorporate this type of analysis, um, the better off your investments will be for sure. Okay, thank you for that. Um, there is one more question from Simon, and he's asking, uh, what are the basic requirements to get started in automated trading? Well, with automated trading, you definitely have to have uh, decent uh, programming skills if you're going to be doing it yourself. Um, that said, like I guess within the scope of that question, you could be involved. Um, you could work with a developer. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, it's going to cost you some money, but um, you could hire someone or partner with someone, which is probably better, uh, that knows programming. Um, but the key component is to be thinking programmatically, to be thinking, okay, how would I quantify this? Um, that's something I started doing early on, like, you know, after my initial prop trading days was, you know, how, how could I, tell a computer <laughs> to do this, you know, um, which is an important step. Um, but once you start thinking that way, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, then you can really start to build on when you see something in the markets. And the thing is the markets are all database. So most data based, but um, so anything that, that occurs, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's not too, too much of a stretch to, um, to conceive of it in terms of a uh, programmatic structure. All right, thank you for that. Maybe Sylvia? Mm, okay, I wanted to ask you, Taka, if automated trading is stress-free because most people think that it's sort of like a plug and play kind of a system. So from your experience, how has it been like? Is it challenging for you or? Do you find it more convenient as compared to manual trading? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I would say comparing it to manual trading, it's definitely less stressful. Um, I, I don't know, like just my life stage, uh, you know, and I did a lot of manual trading, um, you know, I, I, this is just much more suited for, especially um, trading cryptocurrencies. Like you're not going to manually trade cryptocurrencies. I mean, you can when the volumes are high, but um, it's, uh, and I think that eventually when you're building a model and you're, and you're building out the API, um, it definitely gets to a point where you just have it on and but you still, there's still, you, you still have exposure to the market. And so there's still going to be some sort of emotional response to that for sure. But um, at some point you just kind of like, it's like you have a kid. It, it's a good analogy. Like you, you, like at first it's like, you know, you think it's all going to be great, but then you got a toddler running around and that's, and it's making a lot of noise and you got to keep, you know, picking up messes. And that's like, you know, when, uh, you know, these things that I went through here, all these different headaches, a series of headaches, and then fixing them. And oh my God, like, why is this, why am I short this much? And uh, blah, blah, blah. But then you get to a point where, you know, your kid gets its license or goes to college. And so you can kind of let it go, but you're still worried about them a little bit. So that's maybe a decent analogy. But um, compared to manual trading, it's definitely uh, less stressful because that tends to be. Um, loading up in a position um, in maybe one instrument, which one instrument, one of the benefits um, to, to automated trading is, is spreading your investments out, portfolio style approach, and that tends to have less volatility. You'll, you'll, your trade horizon is going to be longer. Um, but, you know, when I think of manual trading, I think, you know, back to my days and I was just looking to see when I would had high conviction the market was gonna move in a single direction and trying to own as much of the instrument I was trading and then getting out as soon as it was done. And that that's like the definition of stress, so. All right, so as we conclude, maybe you can tell us where people can find you if you're 
if you make your work publicly available and also any book recommendations on how to get started on automation as well as maybe python you mentioned some site on youtube so maybe yeah as we conclude sure uh well with the with the web youtube websites i don't have a, a particular channel in mind there's just so many um you know you can just kind of look and see he's got a lot of views but there's a lot of helpful um videos uh with automated trading one book that really um struck a chord with me was Perry Kaufman's New Trading Systems and Methods. I mean, that book, I don't know how old it is now, it might be 30 years old, but, um, and there, there's certainly probably better, maybe I say better, but more um, uh, contemporary books. But that book really talks a lot about um, the pitfalls of strategy design, uh, data, uh, uh, curve fitting and stuff like that. And those things are timeless. I mean, that's a, you could talk for hours about that. Um, uh, in terms of my work, um, you know, I work at Informa and, uh, you know, Informa has a bunch of, you know, high, high level analysts covering, um, global macro markets around that we have, you know, covers 24 hours a day, um, markets or offices, you know, all around the globe and excellent fundamental and technical coverage of all these markets. Um, and so, you know, if you contact sales at informa.com, uh, you know, they can set you up with a, a free trial and just to get a, a taste for, um, you know, my, you know, I've got a lot of work on there. And again, some, you know, a bunch of other analysts, you know, we just rolled out crypto coverage actually. So, you know, there's daily updates on that. Uh, I actually have a model that, um, a trend following model that, you know, we publish the signals for that daily um, that has performed quite well. And so, yeah, sales at informa.com is the uh, best way to find my stuff. All right, Taka, thank you so much for sharing us uh, with us your work and what you're passionate about. And we'd love to have you again in the future if you have time. So we really Absolutely. appreciate it. Yeah, okay, my thank pleasure. You so Thanks for having me so much and uh, yeah, happy trading. All right, cheers. Enjoy your weekend. All right, Matthew. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks, guys, for tuning in and sticking with us to the end. We hope you have learned something new. I would like to appreciate Scope Markets for sponsoring this webinar. Remember, you can open a live trading account with Scope Markets and apply the lessons shared by the guest in this webinar to your trading. Many thanks to our guests for speaking to us. We'll be open to have you in the future. Till next time, goodbye.